Divine True Spirit Interactions. In this spirit interaction titled, Stuart interviews Jesus about life since his return. Mary Channel Stewart, a behavioral scientist who has been studying Jesus since Jesus was eight years old, who begins a series of interviews with Jesus on the subject of Jesus and Mary's return to earth and what life is like for Jesus now in comparison to his spirit life experiences. This interaction was recorded on the 28th of August 2018 from 11 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Session 1 Part 1 Hello, friends. My name's Stuart, and uh, I've had the privilege over the last uh, few months to have visited and spoken with Jesus. And today, it's my honour to uh, lead an interview of him. Uh, I'm very grateful to, for the assistance that he's given me, and I have formulated a sort of interview of questions that I would like to ask him, uh, which some of the questions are for, for you, the viewer's benefit, and some of them are things that I'm genuinely curious about. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Stuart. How are you? <laughs> a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It's a a different medium through a medium <laughs> or yeah. a different format yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but it's great to to finally come back and and make good on my promise to ask you some questions yeah <laughs> no worries <laughs> so uh, yeah uh, i'm feeling feeling quite good since our last discussion so yeah uh, it was uh, a great discussion we'll, have to, uh, we'll ask more about that later <laughs> <laughs> sure remember it's my turn next <laughs> <laughs> yes yes we'll go in turns and so uh as you can imagine there's a lot of things that i would like to discuss with you but i mm. thought uh in our first of what will perhaps be a series of interviews of you mm -hmm. i I would like to focus on the time from your birth on earth in this body mm -hmm. uh, up until the time when you had what we like to call your awakening <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to who you truly are. Mm. Uh, there's many things I observed and as I've shared with your viewers and with yourself in the past that I was attracted to you when you were, you know, uh, no longer, you were around eight, um, and I saw some anomalies in, in your spirit body, and, and I was quite interested. Uh, mm. But before that time, I've, I've heard, I've spoken to people who, who were around you at that time, and actually a great many people who were around you at that time of your birth and in your infancy and earlier years, uh, um, so I now have some awareness of, of what your life was like before then, but I'd like to ask you about your perceptions mm -hmm. at that time and um, then to talk to you about some of the things as we progress some of the th on through your life. Uh, I'd like to ask about some of the things that I observed and how and we can perhaps compare how I interpreted them at the time uh, to how I understand them now and also how they were for you experiencing them at that time. Mm. Does that sound okay? Yeah, it sounds good. And, and having some, uh, having your experience as an observer would be interesting as well. Like, so I feel it's going to be interesting. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to ask, but it might be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I imagine there's a lot of things that uh, we could talk about. I'll do my very best to, to cover things. I'm sure your viewers would have other questions, uh, but I don't necessarily know what all of those are. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, let's, let's proceed anyway. Sure. I've spoken to people about uh, what it was like to observe your birth. I imagine that you don't have any memories of or conscious memories at this time of your birth. Is that correct? 
Well, it's really quite strange um, with regard to this particular life because I do have some very vivid memories uh, around that it, that occurred around the time of my birth. Um, that are, are sort of it's it, what I find quite strange is that a lot of my memories are, um, back at that time are sort of like an adult observing. Um, so it's like uh, like I understand it now mm -hmm. to be the experience of a, a sort of a developed soul inside of a body that it doesn't you know with the mind of a of a child that doesn't understand what's going on. But yeah, there were there were quite some quite vivid memories I can re I, I can recall about shortly after my birth about world events and things like that which i'd have no way of knowing <laughs> but uh aside from them being actual memories so uh like things like um jfk's assassination for example and things like that that where my parents were obviously concerned about certain things that had occurred at the time and they were involved in the news of that mm -hmm. and as a result of that i i have all these memories associated with it that but I know that I was just a child or in fact just a baby and mm -hmm. um, who would not normally have any recollection. And mm. so when you speak about say for example the assassination of JFK mm. are you remembering you it's not as if you were at the event it's as if you were around your parents and and witnessing what happened in your household or so it's as if you are remembering what happened around you at that time? Well, it's really quite strange because I do have memories associated with almost being at the location as well. So there are, it, it's like there's been all the way through my life, there's been filters, if you like, from obviously what I'm observing in my spirit state or mm. in the soul state and sort of dribbling into my consciousness in the physical state. Mm -hmm. And that has always been quite confusing and in fact uh, later on in my life as you probably would have observed i did all my i could to turn all that off really mm. um so yeah so in the early stages of my life um there were all these sort of dribbling of events uh, and conscious awareness of events and um, world events as well as events in my own family um and as a result, um, it was lo sort of like I was an observer, an adult observer, but um, some of the, f the child would not, would filter the, the experience quite significantly at times. Other times I would have a fairly clear recollection. And so, you know, it's, it's quite, it was quite confusing as a child um, because of that. Yeah. So are you describing... Um really a memory of yourself in a soul or spirit form uh, being present at a world event as well as having a memory of the experience of what it was like for you as an infant in your home environment when that event occurred. Yeah and a, it's a sort of a mixture of those two things and um, perhaps if I can give another example when I was a child I had these uh, very very vivid uh, um, memories of, of visiting things, places on earth like the, the Grand Canyon and other places on earth that I've always been attracted to nature as you know so mm -hmm. and and as a child I, I have memories of visiting those particular places and of course as a child I never visited them you know in fact when I was quite young as you would know um, my parents were quite poor and we didn't even visit the nearby city until I was quite you know I, I was I, uh, uh, later in my childhood so um, we, we didn't have the means to travel very easily and mm -hmm. uh, they had very busy lives just trying to make a make ends meet really and so you know I, I but I have all these memories of visiting different locations on earth and and some of those locations I've actually visited since so with the Grand Canyon for example mm -hmm. uh, as you know I visited that uh, in, in one of my visits to the US but it was like I'd already been there mm. and, and it's really quite strange sensations with with events like that and I can I remember having the recollection of standing on on these in these places and then of course some of the recollections were spirit based recollections as well of standing in different uh, places in the spirit world mm -hmm. and they, they would be totally confusing so I had no explanation for those either and um, so I, I didn't know what to do with those either. Yeah.
So when you describe uh, having memories of the spirit based, uh, being in various locations in the spirit world, mm -hmm. Uh, what kind of locations? What, were they pleasant locales or were they uh, unpleasant? Well, some were pleasant and uh, mm -hmm. some were not so pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, you know, some were, you know, locations in the hills where I could, where I obviously were visiting people at the time, trying to help them. But that's not how it felt to me as a child. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt to me as a child quite fr frightening and scary. And then other times, um, being nice locations and then in other times it would be me in the spirit form visiting earth itself uh, and locations on earth so and all of these kind of events happened uh, you know up until i can remember sort of the latest ones happening when i was i was about five to seven years of age and then it slowly started uh, ceasing over that period of time so by the time i was 10 I really didn't have many recollections of my childhood at all mm -hmm. um, because I was obviously shutting down quite a lot of my emotional experience by that stage. Yes. Mm. So to clarify that a little further, you're describing an experience where at the age of 10 you, you had shut down enough that even some of, are you saying that even some of the memories that you are now describing to me were no longer really conscious memories. Well, I was. I would say they. The best way to describe it is that I, I was sort of in this state where I could remember the events actually occurred. I had no explanation for them, mm -hmm. and as a result, um, there was quite a lot of confusion during that phase of my life too. I had memories of of torture as well, mm -hmm. so that created quite a lot of confusion. And, and so in the end, I basically, um, from what I understand now, you know, but back then um, I didn't really understand this, but basically I, I spent a lot of time then in my mind trying to shut down my feelings about different matters. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if you observed from the time of eight onwards, you could see, you could probably see that process happening quite significantly. But by the time I was 12, as you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't really have too many very clear memories of my childhood at all mm -hmm. um, because of this attempt to shut down my experiences. Mm -hmm. But also, um, I, I remember having um, what I would best classify as, and I'm still a bit uncertain about them, about the actual incarnation process, the, the actual well, fall into the body, if you like. Yes, yeah. and I realised uh, <laughs> after I asked my first question that I wanted to go back and talk to you about that, yeah. uh, that process. But um, perhaps we could clarify just a little bit more about memory mm -hmm. <laughs> and how you experience it, because then I would very much like to talk to you about that experience. Sure. I've heard you speak of that experience uh, in the past, yeah. those memories. So I suppose from my background as a scientist uh, and in my exploration of the, uh, the, exper the human experience of memory, I sort of have ordered it in uh, theoretically in this way. Mm -hmm. One is that firstly an event happens and while it's happening, there, there can be some conscious awareness of what is happening, and uh, but dependent upon the level of development of the brain is how I would have explained it. Mm -hmm. um, so th that depending on the development of the brain is dependent on, upon the amount of conscious awareness of what is happening. Mm. And then uh, moving forward through time, if you like, then the ability to recall that event. So first there is the conscious awareness of the experience or the event. And then as time moves forward, the ability to recall that experience um, or event is really what I would call memory. Mm. And it sounds as though what you're saying is that there, well, I guess I'd like to clarify for the listener and for myself to some degree, uh, when you're describing, for example, things that happened in your infancy uh, and then you're describing having a memory of those things and then you're describing the process of shutting down the memory of those things, 
and now you have the memory of those things. Uh, just to understand a little bit about what that's been like for you mm. and also at what point did you have the recall of the... Uh, oh, there's many questions. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, how much conscious awareness of the events did you have as a, in, your, in the brain you have now, I suppose, is one part of the questions. And I'll pose them all because I suspect your answers will encompass all of the, mm. all of the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so what level of conscious awareness did the brain that you have now, which I understand is separate from your soul-based uh, experience of things, mm -hmm. um, how much conscious awareness did the brain have as opposed to the soul? And then... Um, the ability to recall the events, uh, say prior to the age of 10, uh, was that as intact as it is now? And if it was, that must have been very disorientating for you uh, in that time period between 8 and 12, where it was almost like you were disassociating yourself from parts of your experience. Mm. Um, and if in amongst that you would like to address the, the issues that you started to speak about, about the, the, the incarnation, um, incarnation process, so. process then, then please do so, friend. I, I just... Uh, I, I, well, you'll have to remind me of all the things okay. you just asked. Okay. I, I'll, I'll see how I go with all that. Um, well, uh, firstly, uh, the best way I could uh, liken it to now, obviously my feelings about it now are very, very different to my feelings about it at the time. And perhaps what I need to do firstly is describe my feelings at the time and then describe, you know, what I know about that now. That would be wonderful. Because, um, you know, obviously that there's quite a lot of difference between those two states. But when, when I was very young, before I had a developed intellect, and, and my probably intellect developed quite young, as you probably are aware. And mm -hmm. um, so by the time I was five, I was reading adult books and so forth. And I don't mean R-rated books, I mean just <laughs> <laughs> adult books, you know, like you know not not children's books and mm -hmm. and uh, you know and so um obviously i already had quite a lot of uh, difficulty staying with my emotions by that stage but before that stage what would happen is that i would have feelings about things which you, you would be best classified in two different areas one would be about the events that were actually happening in my life uh, from day to day mm -hmm. so as a child so I would you know so like any other child I would play and like any other child I would experiment and as you know sometimes I was a bit uh, dangerous with my experimentations but you know <laughs> that, like any other child would probably be right yes. and and so there were there were those experiences which I'd sort of classify as normal types of experiences that a child would have during their growing years and, and particularly their formulative years up until the age of seven and I always had some level of recollection of those particular events um, to a degree, um, you know, at the time of seven or eight years of age, by the time you, you met me. But then there was this other group of uh, memories, I suppose you would call them, which were all coming, what I, what I now know to be coming from my soul, but I had no awareness of that. I didn't, I, I didn't believe in spirits either, so I had no awareness of a spirit life, really. Um, due to my upbringing and and also I had uh, no real awareness of of what other place these particular memories could be coming from and and I never really spoke about them in fact I don't think I had any occasions where I spoke about them I, I knew that if I spoke about them I would probably be viewed as crazy by that stage even mm. and so um so I'd have all these experiences and memories, um, but I knew they weren't part, part of this life that I currently was experiencing, but uh, I could not explain them in any way, and some of them were quite distressing. So, you know, so when I say distressing, you know, memories of, of my torture in the first century, um, that kind of distressing, and then there were other um, ones that were what you would classify as nice but also distressing in a in a sad way you know like mm -hmm. in the sense that I, I would always feel that 
a deep degree of sadness about sort of loss about of them. And, and it felt to me that those kind of memories were, were always very difficult to handle emotionally. As a child, they were easier perhaps um, with an undeveloped intellect. But once I started, my intellect started developing, and as I said, it started developing quite young, um, they became more and more distressing. And so um, because of that, I would, I would, you know, try to dismiss them, mm. naturally. And in the process of dismissing them, what actually occurred was that I also could no longer remember the actual uh, experiences of my childhood easily either. So, so it had the subsequent result of uh, detuning me from my childhood experience as well. Yeah. This speaks to a point that I observe in all of those who have returned. Mm -hmm. uh, what it sounds as though you're describing is that there were experiences in your childhood that your intellect associated with the brain you have now uh, was harmonious with. Yes. And then there were other experiences that you had simply from an emotional level that your rational intellect couldn't assimilate. Yes. Is that correct? That would be correct, yeah. Yes. And, you know, while I was having them, um, you know, obviously there's the additional distress of the fact that not only are you having them, so that you're going through memories of, and you also have responses to those memories emotionally. But also while I was having them, there's this sort of deep intellectual disturbance about them as well. So, in other words, it felt like something's wrong here, that they don't make any sense to me. They don't make any sense in my life. I can't make head or tails of it, as the saying goes here in Australia. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I can't really determine, you know, what, what, what's up and down about those particular memories. And so the best thing to do is just dismiss them. So in that case, the, the, even as a child, your these memories that weren't congruous with the lived experience in the body that you were in uh, were obviously occurring within you emotionally and registering in your intellect. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, this was a, was this a way of under, uh, let me rephrase the question. Uh, was there a sense of what you were remembering? In, so you mentioned torture, for example. Was there a sense of understanding uh, actual events as the emotions sort of registered in your intellect? Did you understand what the events were and then the intellect fought with that? Yeah, uh, the best way to liken it is um, emotionally they felt like actual events. Mm -hmm. um, but because there was no intellectual way of recognising an event of actually, as actually happening in my current life, mm -hmm. there was a strong desire to deny the event intellectually. So, but emotionally, they felt like the actual event. And in fact, you know, it's like, a, like with regard to, um, you know, a, a person who experiences trauma or any other kind of event in their, in, in, in their life, and if you had unresolved emotions about them, you would feel about them when you rec recollect them. And that's what would happen. So, so I, would, I would feel about them, mostly privately. And as you know, by the time I was eight years of age, I spent a lot of time by myself. Yes. And pretty much most of my life by myself. And so um, I, I would uh, be able to, ha you know, feel it emotionally, but my mind wouldn't let me go there emotionally. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it was quite difficult. I, I sort of feel at that stage, if I had someone um, where I had a better connection with God at that time um, and was allowed to experience those things emotionally, I probably wouldn't have detuned emotionally so much as I did. But the reality is that uh, I didn't feel any of that. I felt quite alone. And so um, it was very difficult for me to even contemplate talking about any of these things to anybody. So. Um, so what I decided to do was just try to forget about them as best I was able. Mm. Mm. Yes, and that's probably in harmony with what I observed when I first uh, uh, came around you. I, I didn't um, 
I could see from your spirit form that you were different, but I have the sense that a lot of that struggle between uh, uh, emotion and intellect uh, was already being, um, the intellect was dominating that mm. emotional experience by that time. Yeah. So was it very, I suppose uh, the question is, um, when you found yourself attempting to suppress those uh, experiences that you didn't have, that didn't match with your reality mm -hmm. um, in, in, the, in your current form, was when you were attempting to suppress those things, was it because uh, those emotions were frightening in and of themselves or was it because you were trying very much as a child to construct a congruous sense of reality, which is what most children are doing through their development anyway? Mm. Do you understand? Yeah, I do. I, I think it's a combination of both, mm. Stuart, probably. Um, you know, obviously there was a deep desire to try to sort of, by, by this stage I had a fairly well-developed intellect, so there was a deep desire to match my logical and re real existence with what I was internally experiencing. So that, that is definitely one aspect of it. And the other is that, yes, uh, many of the memories were distressing. And so naturally, you know, when you've been brought up in this world, as you know, mm. most of the time you're trying to detune from distressing events. And so I think it was a combination of factors really that caused uh, me to be quite detuned emotionally by the time I was 12. Mm. Um, and uh, and when I say detuned emotionally, it's probably not strictly correct because I've still quite, I still engaged my desires quite a lot, mm. and I still did things uh, quite a lot. You know, I, I I enjoyed a lot of the things that I did quite a lot, so I still had quite a lot of joy, but 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 I I just tried to forget and dismiss anything that didn't match what I could see was my current reality, which was you know my experience up to that age of twelve. Uh, just my experiences that I could recollect in my mind and mm. not the experiences that I was feeling uh, actually happened but come from somewhere else that I couldn't explain. And so what I was trying to do was just um, sort of stay true to the memories that I could actually recollect in my mind mm -hmm. and, and matched my reality. And, and by this stage, uh, putting a lot of things that were happening else uh, otherwise in in the basket of all too hard to resolve <laughs> mm, mm. and uh, and and also uh, at the time I, I i feel there was no one in my life that i could have discussed those particular things with and i didn't as i as as you know have a really developed uh, sense of my relationship with god and so i didn't you know i, I would spend a lot of time uh in in reflection, self-reflection, mm -hmm. uh, but very, you know, I wouldn't discuss it with anybody, basically. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so that was one of my questions, if you ever had the experience of attempting to, to reflect what your internal experience was with anyone else, but no. No, no I, don't, I, I, I can't recall any time where I've, I've done that, even probably up to this day, really, mm. with a lot of my experiences. Um, you know, I, I do believe that the majority of people have a deep difficulty even understanding uh, that Jesus and 13 others are back in, on, on earth and how that could have even occurred, let alone accept the personal, emotional and psychological experiences that those particular people are going through. So, um, you know, I, I, like, as you know, I've never, never had an opportunity to discuss that with pretty much anybody mm. at this stage. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so there's many, many questions <laughs> that are, are even just We still about... haven't answered that uh, incarnation question. No, have I haven't so. forgotten <laughs> no that, worries. so I, I do want to return because I would like to talk to you about that in some depth as sure. well. Um, so you mentioned, though, you mentioned uh, that upon reflection now, a feeling that if you had have had a connection with God at the, in those early years, that perhaps things would have gone a little differently. Mm. So I do know uh, from observing you that you, there was a spiritual life within your family, as in mm. there was, uh, you were members of a religion. Mm. Um, what, 
what was your conception of God at that time? Uh, obviously, it was not um, that God was someone who you could uh, share such experiences with. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Um, well, it was sort of an interesting conception, and probably still quite undeveloped, to be mm-hmm. honest. Even even though my family spent a lot of time studying the Bible and and uh, attending, you know, religious studies and so forth, uh, and what people would classify as church. My mother at first was a Anglican, and uh, and then she went through a lot of different studies of different religious faiths and. Eventually, my family became Jehovah's of the Jehovah's Witness faith, mm-hmm. but and and anybody who's been connected with that faith would know that, particularly you know we're talking now fifty plus years ago, um, you know it was it was there were many meetings per week. There was a lot of studying of the Bible going on and, and a lot of uh, analysis of the Bible as well, mm-hmm. and uh, and. I certainly, I never, I can never remember a time when I didn't sort of believe that God existed, which is, I suppose, interesting in itself because it most people go through a period of their life generally where, you know, they, they don't really believe God exists, you know. Mm. But um, I never, I've always believed God existed. I, I, I just didn't have a personal relationship, although there were times, as you probably would have observed, yes. There were times when I would connect with something emotionally, particularly in the Bible, uh, when I was reading, particularly some of the old prophetic books of the Bible, I would, I would, you know, connect emotionally to those things. And so, for example, prophecies in the book of Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and so forth, and uh, and some of the other books too, I would have a sort of deep connection with, and, and you know, even to the point sometimes of tears, and then. And then, of course, uh, I would obviously at that time sort of re-establish a bit of my relationship with God. But, mm. but at times I just thought that it was just, and I uh, could observe that with the rest of my family, they didn't have these kind of emotional experiences. So um, at the time, I just thought I was just probably more emotional than most, you know, and, and I didn't really put much store in them and I certainly didn't... Um, Put, put the story in them that I was actually at that moment having a relationship with God yes. where I was feeling some of God's feelings for me and so forth. And it, it sort of that sort of developed much, much later. Yeah. Mm. 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 From my observation of you, say, between the ages of 10 and 12, you really took a lot of steps in that time to really, uh, well, really develop yourself as a, uh, difficult to describe it's not that you were invested in pleasing those people around you but you had a strong sense of a desire to be a good person Mm. uh, and develop that within yourself Uh, it's just that as we now know some of those understandings of what made a good person were flawed were flawed Mm. but in many respects they weren't Mm. and so uh no, that's true. I, you know, um, when probably between the ages of 10 to 12, but probably even a bit earlier than that, oh, as yes. you know, I was quite a self-responsible child. You know, um, I would frequently, you know, prepare two or three or more of the meals of, for the family per week, you know, do the washing, do the ironing, do the... Mm-hmm. My room was always tidy. My parents never had to ask me to do any of those things. And so during that phase, um, there was quite a lot of, you know, I, have, I was very self-responsible. To, to the point almost where people didn't notice me much mm. because there was nothing, um, you know, there was nothing outstanding to address with me. And so most of, the, most of my family, you know, didn't even really notice me very much as a result of it. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, I, would, I was, you know, during that time I, I was quite given a lot of freedom. Mm. My, my family weren't that interested in me. so. Um, I was given a lot of freedom, and and I actually enjoyed the freedom, mm. as quite a lot actually. It helped. I, I spent a lot of time in nature, and when I wasn't in nature, I was doing my businesses. As you know, I had little businesses yes. going by that stage where you know I would be fruit picking or fruit cutting or you know producing string art or some other form of art that I could sell. And when I sold my art, I would then buy photography equipment or whatever with that. I, of course, during that time, my parents were still quite poor, so they couldn't do any of those things for me. So I mm-hmm. had to generate all that myself. 
and I actually quite enjoyed all that. But but I was also so so there was quite a lot of desire in my life there where I quite enjoyed engaging all of that. As you know, I was pretty physically active as well, and I enjoyed you know riding my push bike and roller skating and all these other things. And and so you know there was quite a lot going on, and my life was quite I felt quite uh, full. Besides the fact that by this stage we were also knocking on people's doors, preaching, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and a lot of other things like that going on as well. So. You know, there was quite a lot happening in my life, um, but there was still this quite strong dismissal. And by the by, the time of twelve, quite a strong dismissal of any of these previous events that I would classify as ab- that I would probably by that stage have classified as aberrations. Mm. And and many of them by that stage I couldn't even remember anymore, mm. uh, unless I gave it a lot of thought, which I tried not to do. <laughs> yes, yes, and yeah. and. From my observations, this period uh, was very much about you engaging with the world that you lived in, Uh, but you did it in quite an unusual way uh, from from my perspective, having observed a lot of children Mm -hmm. in their development and their behaviour, in that you did seem to uh, experience sort of a singular kind of a a joy within yourself just through the expression of uh, being self-responsible and being creative and, and doing things. There wasn't a sense of duty or obligation that was driving you, hmm. uh, nor was there a desire to earn recognition because, as you rightly say, there, was, there wasn't much attention paid to you in any case. No. Uh, or recognition perhaps, for what I, of any achievement, really. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. and perhaps if you had have had uh, less responsibility, you would have gained more attention yeah. within your family unit. Mm. Uh, from my observation of yes. the latter children who came along. Yeah. Um, so this 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 is quite um, interesting, even at the time, for me to observe how much you. You really were your own person or your own unit from a very young age and uh, didn't have strong dependencies on anyone for anything. No. And you seem to get a lot of joy just from uh, expressing, as you said, your desire and your, your will. Yeah, and doing good, th- good things that I felt were good to do. Yes. And, and my, f- you know, I suppose... Uh, and by the time I was 12, I, as you know, I didn't really have a very strong connection to family anymore mm. either. It's sort of like I was living in the family, but frequently I felt to be, it felt to me that I was sort of um, observing the family rather than actually participating in mm. the family, even though I, would, I often did a lot of the work in the family, mm. um, particularly when it comes to the children, I did, all, did most of the work. Uh, that, or if we added all the cho- children's work together, I probably did the, the lion's share of it mm. during that time. And 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 yet, you know, like, I st- it still felt to me like I was sort of like, I don't know. It, it's a strange feeling when it comes to my family too, because and they don't really understand it even to this day, mm-hmm. because they are quite bonded with each other uh, to this day. But they sort of see me as an outcast but it's not an outcast it's not really an outcast it's more that i've never been overly concerned about the family type of thing (laughs) and so i i I know there is a large degree of confusion in them about that you know and when you say concerned do you mean concerned as in the sense of caring or invested no uh, not in terms of caring because i cared for everyone in the family um uh, as you know like Mm -hmm. frequently you know I i would do things to to help their life, yes, but um, but more of an investment in terms of having trying to have a relationship with them. Or what I notice in a lot of families is there's a lot of codependent addiction in relationships between family members, and I never felt that tug or pull to mm-hmm. get involved in any of that. So, so and and that's been quite confusing for well everyone in my family, but particularly probably my brother and my mother. Mm-hmm. Um, They've been very confused by that um, because they both have quite strong desires for family. And so, um, you know, that's been of of great difficulty for them to to come to terms with the fact that I don't seem to have much connection with my family. And so um, 
obviously the life you lead now today is very different from your family, but really mm. you're describing that this sense of being different and separate from them has been with you since since you were very young. It's yeah, early, early childhood. Um, mm -hmm. I never felt, um, I, I, the best way to put it, I suppose, is that I felt things were bigger than what they wanted to make them to be, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that, you know, it felt more like all people in my family, not just my mum, dad, and brother and sister. Mm. And, and my sister is two years younger than I, and my brother 10 years younger than I. But, um, you know, in both cases, I, I don't, you know, I've always had this sort of feeling that they're my brothers and sister, but, but so are everybody else on the earth sort of thing. Mm. And so I didn't see the necessity to put your family first, as most people on the planet today feel. Mm. I feel you put everybody, for, for, like everyone deserves to be first, if you could say it that way. Yes. And I've always felt that way, even from a, a young age, as you would probably have observed as well. And I was also at this stage quite, I used to attract a lot of violence, um, uh, particularly from other children who were spirit influenced, mm -hmm. um, but frequently also from parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though I did nothing to encourage or to evoke such violence, they would become violent with me. And, and I would always find that quite confusing. I didn't know why. Uh, it never, uh, and, and to be honest, I never even resolved why until my early 30s um, mm. as to why that was actually occurring. Because mm. I, I didn't understand uh, how much during that phase of my life, how much spirit influence there was to try to damage my life. Mm. And so, um, but it was quite extreme at times. And, uh, and quite a lot of violence occurred during that formative process up until the age of 12. And how did you make sense of that? Um, at the time? I don't, I don't know if I did. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I was very frequently confused about why people would get so violent with me mm -hmm. when I'd done nothing to invoke the violence. Um, you know, I, I could understand that if I was attacking or abusive or, you know, or, or belittling or some other, you know, thing that would evoke or, or trigger such violence. But I never was as a child. And so, in fact, I'm far more outspoken now than I was as a child. Um, although when it came to spiritual matters, I was often outspoken as a child. But, mm -hmm. um, but with pretty much everything else, I, I kept my to my own counsel. And so it was, uh, you know, aside from matters of truth or matters of spiritual truth or matters of factual truth, um, generally I wouldn't speak up. And, uh, and so I was quite often confused about why there was so much violence. Mm. Yeah. That is similar to how you are today, though, I observe. <laughs> it's just that most of your life is focused around spiritual truth now. Yes, yes. yeah. Obviously, back then, um, you know, I was trying to fit into a life of some kind. I didn't really have much. Uh, unlike most children, I didn't really have high, high goals or ideals, you know. Mm. I, I never dreamed to be, you know, a, a fire engine driver or a fireman or a policeman or you know I never had any real dreams about what I was going to do with the rest of my life when I was growing up. Mm. Mm. Okay uh, quickly before we move on would you give some examples of the kind of violence because perhaps your listeners don't understand? Um, um, a, lot, a lot of it was uh, just where un, un uh, for no reason, people come up and just, you know, physically uh, be violent with me, like punch me or hit me or, or grab me or try to hurt me or, mm -hmm. um, and most most uh, people who did it probably didn't even know why they were doing it. Mm. Like the, there seemed to be even quite a lot of confusion as to why, in them as to why they were doing it at times, and. Um, and then on top of that, I would frequently also get uh, a lot of attack from animals and stuff like that as well, which, which, was, uh, um, which was interesting in itself, mm. considering that I love nature. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yet certain animals, particularly dogs, uh, used to attack me quite a lot. And, and so it, th there was a lot of confusion in me as to why certain things were happening. And, and it wasn't until in my mid-30s, uh, as you know, that I really started recognising why a lot of these things actually happened. Yeah. Because my own family was not uh, per, uh, people, they weren't people who attracted violence either. They, you know, both my dad and my mum 
are generally quite gentle people in comparison to the average person today, I suppose you would say. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes they're not uh, verbally so gentle, but um, certainly from a physical violence perspective, they're quite gentle. And, and um, so, you know, um, it was rare for me to be belted by my, by my father or my mother. Mm -hmm. um, usually I got belted because of something my brother or sister did. Um, but, um, you know, aside from that, it was rare for me to be belted or smacked or anything like that. Um, but there was just a lot of external violence from children at school and even teachers at school where, um, you know, they'd cane me for whatever, for something I'd supposedly done that I hadn't done and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm. Let's go back now to your memories of, well, you touched upon um, memories because I started the discussion at your birth when really we should have started at your conception, perhaps. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, do you have memories of your conception? Yeah, I do, um, which was also, also quite disturbing, <laughs> mm. I found. So, you know, naturally I turned them off. I, I've only really come to terms with them again since I in my 30s. But, um, but I do have particularly the, the feeling of just um, coming down to the earth through, well, as you know, the 36th uh, sphere is, is quite removed from the earth so in terms of distance mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the, the uh, you know, the space between, between two, the two locations. And um, the incarnation process felt not, it felt like a compression of myself down to nothing pretty much. Um, where I you know, felt to be an expansive being, just being compressed, 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 until I became a pinprick is, is the feeling that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, but also it was a sense of travel uh, through, you know, through light years of space uh, in blackness as well. And this constant feeling of falling as well, all the way through it mm -hmm. until, until um, I was in the womb, obviously. Um, now, I didn't have those memories. I had those memories when I was young, very young as a child, uh, and I shut them down again by mm -hmm. the time I was 12. Um, but I've uh, had to revisit them, obviously, and I'm still in the process of revisiting some of them now So uh, because I do feel it has, has, has had an impact on the levels of fear that I actually experienced. So, um, but it was a like every time I've ever thought of it and felt it, it's always been a very terrifying experience so mm. Mm. Um, and so when you mention having the memory as a child shutting it down and then remembering it again as an adult because you've mentioned that a few times about various memories when you remember it as an adult obviously until that point as an adult you're not consciously aware that you had the memory as a child mm. So what is that experience like when you, as an adult, begin to connect with a memory and then seemingly you realise that you've, you've had the memory before? before. Mm. Yeah, um, it, it's difficult too because, uh, you know, but, but also good in some ways because um, as an adult, and when, when I say as an adult, I mean in my 30s, uh, mm -hmm. when I had what you would classify as my awakening or mm -hmm. my awareness beginning to grow, about what was actually happening and then then it was a bit different because i could uh, i was getting explanations for events that i've always been very confused about and so so while i was um, having an emotional experience i would also obviously become aware of what that emotional experience was about so i became it, it became very informative which which helped quite a lot obviously yeah. but but what i learned through that early experience of opening up emotionally in my 30s is that um the more i opened up emotionally the more uh, easily understood everything become and 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 the memory flow from my childhood was a subsequent result of it not it wasn't something that i was aiming for or anything like that mm -hmm. it was just a net result of opening up further emotionally to truth in, in regard to the truth of my life and the truth of my more the truth of my emotions which is all about what your emotional experience is so 
I, I became more truthful about what I was actually feeling and I then went through the experience of what I was feeling and then as a result of that I would receive more truth about why I had that particular experience in the first place. Mm, mm. So you're, you're speaking there about opening up t emotionally to how you felt at that age in your 30s and in your life at that time in your 30s. That's right. Opening up there and yeah. then that was in giving you this other gift, did you call it a gift at the time, of more awareness of events from your past or what you would probably now call mm. the causes. Well, you, you observed me at the time, so mm. you would have known whether I thought it was a gift or not. But <laughs> um, I think most of the time I did uh, because it, it felt um, like a gathering. While, while the emotional experiences were often traumatic, mm -hmm. um, it always ended with, the, with a lot more calmness, uh, uh, less terror inside of me, and, uh, and my physical health improved significantly. Um, and on top of that, a lot of things that have been unanswered for most of my life uh, became quite apparent in terms of what their answers were, even though nobody around me could, could or would accept those answers. They, uh, it became quite apparent to me that there was only really one explanation. Mm. Mm. I suppose from my observation at that time, what I observed was, and it's something that I've always respected about yourself, is that once you find uh, a strategy that you believe has benefit and you test that and uh, you, you build upon that very strongly. And so once from, from my experience of observing you, it was as if you uh, had these emotional experiences, you clearly felt better. And so it was very rapid for you to trust that that was going to work from now on? Yes, it, it sort of, it was interesting for me because um, the net result was a much calmer life and a lot, and a lot obviously the, my life improved significantly during that phase of my life. Um, but also, um, I, I sort of feel like it, it, was, it was interesting in a way because I, I always were, was in this, I can't really find the words to put it together, but the, this period of my life was a, um, a difficult and distressing emotionally period of my life, but at the same time it was a, a growing sense of freedom and joy mm. in my life. And so I could measure um, from my improvement with regard to my joy and happiness I could measure the fact that these th particular things that I now feel God showed me what to do mm. um, through you know, the conscience really more than any other mechanism and these things that I discovered to do, they worked and as a result, um, because they worked, you, you know, this is what builds faith, you mm. know, you, you know that if something works then you can place more faith upon it and, and therefore put more time and energy into it and continue it. And, and the more I've done that, um, uh, you know, the better my life has become. Now, at that stage, I wasn't considering teaching others about it, of course. I did not have any awareness of who I was at, during that f period of time either. It was just an awareness that I needed to connect emotionally mm. to my life in order to heal and, and obtain a better life. Mm. And I needed to be very honest and truthful about where my life was and where it was going and where it was going to have to end up if I was going to be happier. And, and as you know, at that stage, sometimes I had very extreme despair, but at other times I felt quite confident um, that no, this was, uh, even though I had not yet discovered who I was uh, in, from an emotional perspective, I, at this stage, ha had some developing emotional awareness is the best way to put it. I, I, I think you could say at the age of 33, which as you know, or 34, that was the age that I always thought in this life that I would die. Mm. And um, so that, that, that in itself was interesting because, mm. I, because I'd grown up all my life believing that by the time I was 34, I'd be dead. Mm. And so I acted that way. I did everything quite early mm. <laughs> as a yes. result of Even that. from when you were, when I first uh, 
joined you or yes. started to observe you, you were doing things at a much younger age than your peers. That's right. So like most people would create a business maybe in their 20s or 30s. <laughs> I did it when I was, I think I was seven when I started my first one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and the same with the marriage and children and all these other things, none of which I felt, um, you know, I, I didn't feel distressed by. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, most people when they forget married when they're young, they regret it, but I didn't feel distressed by it, you know, and so, um, so a lot of the things I did, I, I did very early in the age, and partly it was because of this underlying feeling that I've had all my life that I, that I would die when I was in my 30s. It's so interesting that you, you bring that up because I was reflecting about my memories of you around that time and trying to quantify how I would describe it. And really, I would call that period your enlivening. It was like you were in, in, enlivened at that time, even though, as you say, you were going through these quite extremes of emotion at times. Mm. It, from, even from the observation of your spiritual body, there was, there was more life and energy uh, yeah, like, happening. I definitely felt that too. Yes. It felt to me that the emotional awakening, which began you know, in well, my early 30s. Yes, and could I make the distinction quickly? When I refer to your awakening, this is not the period. No. This is your enlivening, if That's you call right. it this. Yeah, I, I call the it... awakening is when you had a sense of who you are. Yeah, I sort of feel like uh, the way I call it is my emotional awakening happened in you know, my early 30s. And then my you know, real awakening, mm -hmm. <laughs> my, my identity awakening, if you could call it that happened when I was around 40. So, um, but my emotional awakening was a very important period because I needed the emotional awakening before I'd be able to have the other awakening, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I could see that God was leading me through a process. And I always, as I said, I always thought that I was going to die by the time I was 30, in my early 30s. And uh, which, of course, I never really ver verbalised to anyone. And, and, uh, and the main reason why is because it didn't sound any, <laughs> like there were any logical reason why I would. But, uh, but you know, that's how I felt. And so um, during this phase of my life, uh, this emotional phase of my life, uh, I became a lot more sensitive to emotions. I accepted my emotions a lot more readily. In fact, I accepted emotions that I was totally confused about. Mm -hmm. um, to the point where, so basically now I was accepting emotions that I refused to accept when I was a child. Mm -hmm. uh, emotions of what happened to me, torture and all these other things. I had no explanation of how they could have occurred. And, and yet I found that if I tried to shut down the emotional expression of them, I would severely, uh, you know, it, I would be severely harmed physically and emotionally. And when I say physically, I get very sick mm -hmm. uh, as well, even, you know, really badly sick. And as you know, up until my early 30s, uh, I was a very sickly person mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it, it was barely a month went past without me being sick for a week. And, and, and then after this time period of the, this emotional beginning, if you like, of my life, uh, I, it was very rare for me to get sick. Mm. And that in itself told me a lot. It mm -hmm. told me that, you know, my bottling up of emotions was actually what was causing my physical sicknesses and disease. Mm -hmm. And so during that phase of my life, obviously a lot of my, my diseases and sicknesses that I had all my life healed. Mm. Um, and so that was also very encouraging. I, I knew that even though I was totally confused <laughs> <laughs> about what these experiences were all about, and I wasn't confused about their results. And so, mm. so that helped me continue with the emotional work that by this stage now, pretty much everyone around me think, thought I was nuts doing. Yes, and, and I was just, uh, uh, there's a lot of comments. Um, <laughs> but I was, firstly, I was reflecting that at around this time, it, it, you know, you had, you had had this feeling that you would die. And, and in a way, it was the death of you doing things the world's way, wasn't it? It was, yeah. It was, there was a death and it was the end of your marriage. It was the death of a lot of your constructs that had been set up right from before I even started observing you in mm -hmm. terms of your religious faith and your role that you'd taken on for yourself, I suppose. Although, mm -hmm. again, I've, I'm uncomfortable with saying the role because I, 
I never observed you to 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 consciously attempt to meet a predefined role. No. But certainly there were factors in your early childhood that caused you to fulfill certain roles. And from my observation, all of them went out of the window at around this period. Mm. No, that's dead right. Uh, a number of other things. Uh, just to clarify, when you say that you were sort of anticipating your death, in your early 30s. What kind of feelings did you have associated with that? Was there a sense of panic or urgency in your life um, or fear or grief or what kind of feelings did you have associated with that? No, there, was, there that? was no sense of panic or urgency as you probably know, you know mm -hmm. from the observation. Uh, there was no real fear about it. I just felt that I was going to die then and, and um, there was no urgency to get things done before I died or anything like that. It was just, it, it was just a feeling that uh, that has pervaded all my life that I would die at that age, and um, and uh, I could not explain it, but I did firmly believe it emotionally. Mm. Um, so um, as to what effect that had on how I lived my life, I'm not really sure because I, it didn't drive me to do things I would not have otherwise done. So by the time I was in my mid thirties, I'd, ne I'd never travelled overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, I'd done very little travelling or anything like that by that stage. I, I was a very much uh, still quite uh, living a very quite, you know, in my early thirties after I, I uh, left my wife. Uh, it was a sort of quite a lonely life. Mm -hmm. uh, lived by myself a lot, and and so. There wasn't anything that I felt like I had to do or get done or anything like that. It was just this underlying, pervading, sort of what I believed at the time, knowledge that that I wouldn't be surprised um, that you know I had a car accident or some other accidental death might occur during that stage, and I, I didn't really have a clear idea of what would cause it, but um, but it was just a feeling that I had all my life. Mm. Mm. And uh, so you're saying there was no sense of urgency, but in fact you did do a lot of things much earlier than your peers. Uh, but I didn't do them out of a sense of urgency. I just yes. did them. I felt ready to do them, so I did them. It's like, yeah. you know, um, I didn't feel... And in fact, sometimes I felt like my family were trying to hold me back from them, you know, mm -hmm. like... Mm -hmm. and, and I can see now why, you know, from their perspective, a normal person's life, mm -hmm. uh, you, you probably... You know, want to wait until you got married in your thirties or something like that. You know, from their perspective. Yes. But uh, um, you know, from my perspective, well, I was nineteen and uh, and I, I felt emotionally ready to be to be involved. And and as you know, I also had quite a lot of soulmate grief, uh, mm -hmm. which I didn't understand uh, yeah. at the time. That you know, I was I was always uh, I was always looking for another half of myself. Mm. which I never fully understood really again until my 30s mm. um, as to why I was looking for this other half of myself all the time. And so it felt constantly like I was looking for this other half of myself who, and we would join in a way where we were, um, you know, that we were on the same page emotionally and, and intellectually about things. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never really understood that. And, and it was only in my 30s that I even started to verbalise that to other people. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but that did drive a lot of my relationship, you know, my desire for a relationship. Yes. Uh, and I didn't have a lot of relationships, um, but uh, the desire for a relationship was driven by that underlying grief, mm. which I started also to recognise uh, in my 30s. Mm. Mm. Yes, and from my perspective, observing you all through those years, it's it's quite interesting now in retrospect because, as I've shared, I didn't have a strong, really, uh, I didn't have a strong awareness of my own emotions, and so I was very much an observer of others mm -hmm. and their behaviour and their life and their choices, and I would have said their. Um, well-being or state of mind <laughs> I observed those things a lot but because I'd lacked sensitivity within myself to my own emotional condition I had a limited understanding of what was driving you it's only in recent times that I've 
had a much more complete picture. Mm. Uh, so, for example, I could see that you were quite driven towards a uh, uh, relationship with a woman mm. um, and a, a very, as you say, very bonded relationship or a deep relationship. Yeah, uh, I suppose a lot of psychologists would have described it as a desire for an intense relationship. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, at, at the time I didn't understand myself very well and I didn't understand why. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so... I was observing many of those things. Uh, it was really the the difference in your spirit body that, ha as I've shared before, that attracted me to to watch you because there did seem to be a heightened. It's hard to describe now what it, I. That's why I was observing you because I could. I didn't know how to describe what I was seeing. Mm. It was sort of a. a, a uh, some sense of brightness that was uh, within you that I couldn't observe in others. Mm. And then when it came to this period of um, uh, this enlivening, if I call it that, mm -hmm. I myself thought you were uh, crazy, misguided. I didn't understand why you were making now these choices. I, I understood from a technical perspective in that it, you decided upon a method that you felt would help and it seemed it was evident that it was mm. but I couldn't understand why it was helping so much mm. uh, and I couldn't understand why anyone would want to do it <laughs> even th <laughs> even that sounds illogical doesn't it but that's really well, how I, I, I don't know I, I think it's probably how pretty much everyone around me at the time felt as well <laughs> so um, you know obviously I needed to spend a lot of time alone because any time I discussed it with anybody, they always ridiculed or, or you know, suggested that uh, I, I was doing the wrong thing. So, mm. and and I suppose from my perspective, it's, this is a period where things got really interesting because that brightness that I saw began to be intensified even more, which put you in greater contrast to people around, and so I. Uh, it was very sort of intriguing for me, I suppose. Mm. Uh, and as I've shared previously, my depth of understanding of what was happening was severely limited by my own prejudice or, and my own condition. Mm. But, uh, yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah, it's a, I, I sort of see it now too that during that period of time I started probably attracting different groups of spirits uh, as well. And they would have their own. That would have their own their own problems associated with that, and um, you know. So then I'd have to go through groups of emotions, and it, and it, and after a while, it started feeling like um, you know. For the first few years of it, it was quite intense, as you know. And but by the time I was approaching forty, it sort of calmed down a bit, and uh, and I sort of felt like, oh, I'm at last getting <laughs> <laughs> getting my life together a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it, only to what receive a, silly a shock. Thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> but if, before we move on to the period of awakening, sure. I'd like to take a short break. But before that, <laughs> um, I'd just like to return once again to this incarnation process because we we didn't finish off everything no. there. No. You mentioned when you had this enlivening period in your early 30s you started to allow a lot of emotions and was that at about that period where you began to experience this uh the the emotions that you previously described about falling and being compressed and and coming down Mm, it'd probably be accurate to say it was more that the memories of those particular emotions were coming back to me. So a memory of having had that experience mm. as a child. Mm. Yes. And not really understanding or being able to explain it still, but, but realising that a lot of the fear and terror that I had seemed to be related to those events and also to events associated with torture and so forth. And so during that phase, I allowed myself to feel about, you know, having been tortured and abused. And I also allowed myself to feel about, you know, these feelings that I had as a child. 
without still really understanding what, you know, the way I sort of viewed it was what the hell was that type mm -hmm. thing. I didn't, I didn't have any clear idea about what it was about, but I did have a clear idea that in, in experiencing them, my life got significantly better and significantly better physically in terms of my well-being and also emotionally in terms of my stability and and also in my day-to-day -day life i was able to do more accomplish more and uh, and consider more as well so so i could see and measure the results of my actions even though everyone around me thought i was not doing it mm. and and some people even during that stage tried to have me committed for doing it but but at the end of the day, it was it felt good for me to do it, and I knew I was improving. Mm. Yeah. You did see people uh, at that time, just for the benefit of the listeners. Uh, could you describe you had some engagements with um, psychologists and various other people at around this time? Uh, could you describe that for us? Yes, uh, I started out uh, by doing some what I would classify now as body work, uh, which was, um, and the guy who was helping me do the body work, Eugene, his name is, uh, and I have a lot of affection for, because he, he, he had uh, very little judgment for the actual experience. So while he was never told the reason for the experience, he had little judgment about the actual experience. In fact, him and another psychologist who I got help from at the time, and both felt that because of the way in which my, my body was demonstrating that these particular things had happened to me, mm -hmm. and that it meant that they had happened. And they, in fact, tried to convince me that they'd happened in this life. Mm. And I'm saying to them, well, I don't have any memories of such events. Uh, in this life. So, so I'm just going with the emotions <laughs> is, <laughs> is what I'm saying to them. But I, I didn't have any memories uh, of, of these events in, you know, in this life. So it didn't make any sense to me that I had any reason for having these particular emotions. But the, their confidence in the fact that, and my own confidence in the fact that as I felt these emotions they released, uh, was an indicator that obviously I just needed to let them go was the way I was looking at it. So from a logical perspective, I was going, well, I have no explanation as to why these particular emotions are inside of me, but it makes sense to me to let them go. And as a result of that, I attracted two very kind people during that phase of my life who, who believed in these emotions and allowed me to let them go, mm -hmm. even though they believed that they were caused by childhood events of trauma mm -hmm. in this life. Um, I didn't believe that myself because I didn't have any recollection of those events. Um, but at least they enabled me to go through the, the trauma and, and help me uh, do some work regarding going through the trauma. So the first year and a half of that process, I had some help mm -hmm. and that I engaged very willingly. Like I, it was my desire that drove that uh, process. And, and as a result of that, I worked through a lot of emotion that helped me greatly um, in, in, in terms of my well-being. Mm. Mm. And did you investigate the possibility that you had been, I mean, I know you investigated the possibility that you had been. Yes, I, I eventually abused. went to, um, to groups of people, you know, um, who are survivors of, uh, of childhood abuse. And while I could recognize that their emotions were very similar to my own, um, I still didn't have any memories, so um, that sort of made things difficult. Mm -hmm. I tried to explain some, some of my memories, because uh, remember by this stage I'd had, actually had some memories of torture and so forth. Mm. So while I was connecting to those particular memories um, as a way of dealing with my emotions, um, I still couldn't really explain how those particular things had occurred, yeah, bearing in mind that I didn't have the scars in my body to prove or provide evidence that those particular things had occurred. So, so um, it was quite confusing in some ways, but I felt I needed to go through that process. And, and so I was quite dedicated to that process through that period from 33 to 40. Mm. Um, it's just as a side note, it's quite interesting to observe uh, at groups such as the one you describe, uh, how much spirit interference occurs with people and their memories? 
That was uh, very evident. Mm. Yeah, very. By this stage, I started to feel there was a lot more going on at these groups than what people would admit to. Mm -hmm. And also, I could see that there was a deep desire to exaggerate uh, events at times. Mm -hmm. And also, very little healing was actually occurring because very few of them would actually feel their emotions. Mm. Uh, to in the way that I was doing it. So mm. that also helped me a lot in terms of understanding that there is the insincere processing of emotion mm. and the sincere process of emotion and that and that helped me, you know, make make sure that if I was going to process emotion I needed to be in, in, very sincere about it mm. in terms of very honest and truthful about what was going on. So there was still, but at this stage, there were still feelings that I was having as, oh, I've got no idea how these events have occurred. People were telling me, and I also had memories of a certain events that were quite traumatic. Um, and they, of course, thought they must have occurred in this life. Um, but I knew they hadn't occurred in this life. So at that stage, I'd given up any intellectual desire to <laughs> resolve the issue as to, in terms of how could all that have occurred? All I was now focused on during that phase of my life was, I want to heal from this stuff so that it doesn't bother the rest of my life. So mm. that was my main focus. And you mentioned uh, just briefly that there were people at this time in your life who were concerned for you and wanted to commit you. Would you like to just share quickly about that? Well, you know, there were times, uh, obviously, during this stage, I had a lot of fear that I was going through and quite frequently I'd be shaking and quite, you know, my fam. at one point in time for three months, I lived with my family while I was going through some of these things. And of course, they were very concerned mm -hmm. about all of this. They sort of viewed it as a breakdown and not a breakthrough, mm -hmm. whereas I was viewing it as a breakthrough and not a breakdown. Yes. And quite frequently, you know, they tried to impose their feelings by me about you need to, you know, see the psychiatrist, what does your psychiatrist say and so forth. And eventually I got to talk to some psychiatrists, but eventually I got to see that some psychologists and psychiatrists were not able to cope with emotions themselves. And so they were unable to assist me, whereas other ones could deal with emotions themselves and they were more you know qualified to assist me so so and eventually i grew out of my assist you know i realized that i needed to focus a lot more emotionally than what my people who were helping me were prepared to see me do <laughs> <laughs> as well so by that stage i decided that i was best doing it for myself by myself mm. Mm.